beloved in the Lord, grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. I've been pondering lately the difference between being told something and being shown something. We've been told that those masks are important, an aspect of stopping the spread of the virus. We've been told that study after study shows how that works, how aerosols are cut, out, cut down and, and they're caught and contained, how the viral load is diminished when there are fewer droplets floating around in the air. We've been told that the sooner we all comply with mask wearing, the sooner the infection rates will go down and the more life can begin to return to some sense of normalcy or at least normal interactions. And yet, all the encouraging, all the telling, all the talking has not resulted in near the compliance that's required. Why is that? Well, I think I know. If you watch the president's nomination acceptance speech at the end of the Republican National Convention, you will have your answer. There were over a thousand of our leaders assembled there, not socially distanced, few wearing masks, and all behaving as if the virus could not find them or impact them. It's a classic case of do as we tell you, but not what you see us doing. Actions will always speak louder than words. There are some things that you simply have to be shown, have to be modeled. And most often it's the really important things. So I think it's a big deal in Matthew's gospel today that in this particular passage, language is chosen so specifically, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering. Matthew's gospel portrays Jesus as quite a talker, you know. In Mark's gospel, all we have are the sparse, compact little parables as the words of Jesus. Matthew, however, portrays Jesus as explaining and engaging in longer speeches and greater depth teaching. He doesn't just tell parables, he explains the parables and expands on them. So Jesus is not averse to talking and telling and uses that quite often. But talking and telling have their limits. And especially when it comes to making something clear. I can still remember being taught how to tie my shoes. Do you remember the, the little memory device story that was sometimes used? Oh, you, make, you take and make the two bunny's ears. And then the bunny ear goes around this one and down through the hole and back out. But as helpful as that little story is on how to tie your shoelaces... It's really worthless without being shown how to do it. You notice I can't even do it without needing to show you. The words and story only make sense with a visual of the lace movement in your mind. And so while Jesus has told his disciples many things, when it comes to the really important thing, the divine thing, that's the kind of thing that can only be shown. Words get in the way here and become stumbling blocks. Peter saying, God forbid, is a stumbling block to what Jesus has to show them and show the world. Jesus has to show them and the world that self-preservation is not what brings in the kingdom of God. Trying to save your life will only end up with you ultimately losing your life, losing everything. What does it profit a person to gain the whole world but lose their life? 
Jesus says. And that's a question that's been hanging over him ever since he met Satan out in the wilderness for 40 days. For there, you know, Jesus was offered the whole world if he would just bow down and give homage to Satan. It's little wonder then that when Peter starts talking about Jesus not going to Jerusalem, he gets called Satan, the adversary a stumbling block. We stumble all over this when we think of it simply as a teaching, as just words from Jesus. We puzzle over what the meaning of divine things might be as opposed to human things. If we picture this just as teaching, as words. We quiz ourselves as to whether we're following God and what God would have us do or whether we're pursuing our own self-interests as opposed to human things, when this is just a matter of words and teachings. As long as we remain on the level of this just being teachings and abstract conjectures, we can, we can debate things all day long. Jesus knows that. And he also knows that once he has been identified as the Messiah by Peter, seen in that kind of light, then then nothing short of a full confrontation with the powers of this world will do. A Messiah that does not engage and challenge the rulers of this world is no Messiah, no Savior at all. And if you choose to do that, to go up against the powers of this world, then there was a very visible reminder of what awaits you in Jesus' day. For the punishment for speaking out against the status quo, against the Roman Empire, against the powers of this world that were in control, was the cross. A punishment that was reserved for insurrection, for going against power. Roman ex execution for those who spoke out or rebelled against the workings of the empire was that most cruel and public of executions. So when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus' fate is sealed. Jesus has to go to Jerusalem. He has to follow through with a confrontation with the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And to do that is to come up against all those who stand behind them and enable them in their power. He has to show his followers, show his followers, that divine things are not the same as human things. Divine action is not about saving your own skin. Divine action is not about having the power or pulling the levers of power in this world on the world's terms. Divine things are not interested in getting back what people once had or longing for a bygone era. Divine things are about revealing God's kingdom. A new kingdom, a kingdom that's not of this world or patterned after the way this world works, but rather is about God's intention for this world. From the beginning, God's intention for how things ought to be. It is a world where the Beatitudes are not just pronounced, but they're carried out. They're shown in people's lives. It's a world where the poor in spirit are finally blessed and where those who mourn are finally comforted. It's a world where the meek get their portion and where the merciful receive mercy. It's a kingdom where the pure in heart are blessed and the peacemakers finally receive a blessing as well. None of that comes with just words or teachings. And none of it comes so long as the machinery of this world is allowed to grind on as usual. Someone finally has to show people how to throw a wrench in the workings of this world. And so from this time onward, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. 
Now, he does not suffer just for the sake of suffering. Of that, we must be clear. No, Jesus suffers because he acts in a way that threatens the very way in which this world works. You cannot go to Jerusalem without confronting those who hold power there. And if you do, then you must take hold of what awaits you. And what awaits you is a cross. The punishment for going up against power. This will cost Jesus everything. But in three days' time, God will raise him up, and that becomes the source of hope. The world, you see, wants you to believe that if you're trying to change how things are, <laughs> you're just throwing your life away. The empire wants you to look at the cross, the penalty for insurrection, and think about how painful and how futile your rebellion would be. But Jesus took that symbol of futility and made it a symbol of hope. Do your worst. Think you've won, Satan? God will raise up. And this is where the connection is to us. Some things you just have to be shown, you see. In Christ, we are shown that the difficult path can be taken and the machinery of this world can be confronted and it can be brought to a grinding halt. In Christ, we are shown that the hoped for longings of generations are possible and glimpses of God's kingdom can be found in the choices we make and the paths we take. In Christ, we are shown that what looks like utter failure and defeat can in the end be transformed into victory. You can take up your cross, whatever that may be, and not fear it because it does not have the final say in things. God does. And God raises up. What God has to say to those who lay down their lives for the sake of their neighbor, for the sake of the faith, for the sake of the kingdom, is that they will find life everlasting as a promise and gift from God. Some things you just have to be shown. And so Jesus goes to Jerusalem to show us that we can follow, and to show us that we will be raised. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.